This is Recorded Future, Inside Threat Intelligence for Cybersecurity. Hello everyone, I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire. Thanks for joining us for episode 31 of the Recorded Future podcast. Today we're going to talk about phishing, where a bad actor pretends to be someone they're not in order to get a user to reveal information like a login or password, or to get them to perform a task like transferring money. Phishing has been around for quite a while. Many of us remember breathless emails from a certain Nigerian prince looking to share millions of dollars. It's still around today because it works, and it's inexpensive to do, taking advantage of human nature and most people's desire to be helpful and trusting. Our guest today is Oren Falkowitz, the CEO and founder of Area One Security, a company that specializes in protecting organizations from phishing attacks. He describes the history and continued effectiveness of phishing campaigns, the techniques that companies like Area One Security use to defend against them, and whether or not he thinks it's a problem we'll ultimately solve. Stay with us. You know, one of the interesting things about phishing is that uh, it's something that people have been aware of for a long time. But uh, what they don't know is that about 95% of the time when there's a cyber incident, phishing is the root cause. And they often make comparisons between the types of spam and nuisance emails that you're describing, those Nigerian prince emails or wire me money you know, for the Canadian pharmacy or th- things of that nature. Uh, but phishing really has evolved to be something much more nefarious. Uh, and it's typically not related to those today. Um, phishing attacks are not more technically sophisticated, but they are more authentic than people have known them from the AOL days. And that authenticity comes in two flavors. The first is the vast majority of phishing attacks either look like the most common or trusted brands in the world, Apple, PayPal, Facebook, eBay, Google, Dropbox, uh, all the largest financial institutions, or they have a flavor where they take authenticity that's related to organizational dynamics. So it appears like it's an email requesting information from the CEO of your company, from the CFO, from your manager. And the challenge is that as humans, we see both the the images and the authenticity on the brand side and the authenticity on the colleague side uh, and often are unable to discern that they're malicious or take actions to stop them. You know, if I worked at the Walt Disney Corporation and I got an email from Bob Iger, it's very unlikely that I would say, you know, Bob, I thought that email looked a little strange. And so I chose not to reply or or do your job correctly. And almost 100 percent of the time when users click on something or respond to a phishing attack, they're trying to do their jobs properly. Uh, And so that's, you know, that's a piece where we want to provide technology to help them. So uh, take us through sort of the, the spectrum of uh, the, the degrees to which people use phishing to lure people in. What, what are the types of things that you all typically see? In over 95% of the time when an organization learns that they've been the victim of a cyber incident, they will find that phishing is the root cause. Now, a lot of people think of phishing as an email-only problem, but uh, a vast majority of phishing attacks have a web component, and so the need to solve it has to be comprehensive. And so what we see are basically three flavors of phishing attacks. The first are malicious emails that have links to websites that are malicious, that have files attached to them that, when downloaded or open, will harm a, a computer, or have neither links nor files but get the user to act wire money, send me these documents. Hmm. On the other side of it, we see a variety of different web-based phishing attacks that are either legitimate websites that have been compromised, such as popular schools like uh, harvard.edu or popular websites that people are going to without being lured through a link, and they've been compromised. They have malicious links or malicious code running within the page to infect the computer, or users are entering credentials into those websites, usernames and passwords that can be then used to just log right in. And so we see this in financial institution, credential harvesting, forms of phishing. We see this in websites that look like logins to popular inbox providers like Google and Microsoft Office 365. And so when when attackers are able to garner 
the username and password, they're able to then just log right into those systems and, uh, and, and not even have to really hack is the way most people think about it. That's interesting. So, so not all phishing is email related. Absolutely not. Email is a primary vector for phishing, but it requires a comprehensive solution. Phishing occurs uh, across email, uh, across the network, across the web, and uh, it is not an, an email or email protocol only problem. Can you describe the, the sophistication of the criminals in these various cases? I mean, the, I, I suspect, you know, you, you st- do you start off from um, sort of the, the broad people who are just trying to cast a wide net, and then at the other end you have highly targeted people trying to hit executives or, or get uh, corporate information, things like that? Yeah, sophistication is a really interesting concept, I think, when you involve cybersecurity, because there's nothing about phishing that is sophisticated, and it's used so pervasively by everyone. You know, I spent many years working at the National Security Agency, focused on breaking into computer networks on behalf of the U.S. government. And I would describe that the organizational ways that these uh, hacking groups or countries or, or however you want to describe them work as being sophisticated, but I would describe the tools that they use and the methods by which they go about it as not really being very technologically sophisticated. What I would say is that they're very effective. And the reason they're effective is because if you send just 10 emails to a company, you're going to have a 90% success rate of at least one person uh, clicking or, or being impacted by that. And when you extrapolate that out further to the size of major corporations, small businesses uh, in the United States and around the world, you can see why they're so effective using relatively crude or untechnically sophisticated uh, means. Has there been much evolution in the tactics that these folks use, or do the old tricks still work well enough that they really don't have to change them that much? You know, the evolution as we see it, uh, we see modifications in using new brands that are emerging that evoke trust, using new organizational dynamics that have trust with users, and also taking advantage of world events. And so every time there's an election, every time there's a hurricane, every time there's a G20 summit, every time there's a Super Bowl, every time there's a Black Friday, every time there's a tax day, you know, these are themes that get used. And so the evolution is really one that responds to changes in what's effective from the authenticity angle and then what maps effectively to the calendar. And outside of that, there there really isn't a tremendous amount of evolution. Take us through what you all do in terms of being able to defend against these attacks. Yeah, so in Area 1, we're focused on is preempting phishing attacks, taking uh, decisive actions in a comprehensive way that makes sure that our users aren't impacted by them. And so what we've done is we've built technologies to allow us to go find where do these attacks come from. We find on a daily basis about 70% of the phishing attacks that we identify across email and network and web are unique, meaning they're unknown to others in the cybersecurity industry. They're unknown to our customer base uh, or potential customer base. Uh, And the second is that there is a massive time gap between when we identify it Uh, and when it actually enters into the environment. And that time gap is about 26 days. So we're actually identifying the phishing attacks at a point in time before users are ever seeing them. And that allows us to take very specific actions to make sure that the messages don't end up in the user's inbox, that if they do click on a link, they're protected from resolving that link to uh, something that's malicious. uh, And ultimately, that stops damage completely. And that damage often is thought about in the effects. So if you stop phishing attacks, there is no ransomware. If you stop phishing attacks, there is no business email compromise or financial imposters. If you stop phishing attacks, there's no zero day or or APTs. Those are the effects. uh, And they all come from phishing. And by stopping that, uh, you'll ultimately end up preventing damage. Help me understand how that could work. How can you detect a phishing email before it's been sent out? Well, absolutely. So attackers, you know, use infrastructure. Uh, if I were to register a new Gmail account today, and it was very similar to your name, and then I was going to send you an email with a link in it, the link within that body that might point you to a malicious website, that website actually has to exist before the email can be sent. And so we've built active sensing capabilities uh, that cover the breadth of the World Wide Web that allows to identify those sites at the point that they're created rather than the point that you're about to click on them. And so we create a time advantage uh, on that front. That's just one example of 
of that that time delay. And we often give attackers way too much credit for being sophisticated, as we talked about, but also for being fast and uh, to run the types of effective, uh, scaled out operations that we're seeing impacting hundreds of millions of people, tens of thousands of companies, you really need to be operating uh, factories and assembly lines. Uh, and that creates time advantages for defenders. And because of some new advances in cloud computing and advanced analytics that we've taken advantage of, it actually is turning the, the advantage back for defenders to be preemptive. Now, is it right? I, I've heard people say that um, the websites that these people stand up, they can sometimes be up merely for a matter of hours. That, that certainly uh, that certainly can be true, that they can be up for short periods of time, but they can't exist in a vacuum. A website that goes up is accessible to everybody on the World Wide Web, and that means it can be found. And uh, there are a variety of factors in the creation of those websites that make them discoverable. And the second part of it is that we need to focus on uh, certain normalcy patterns for user behavior and for attacker behavior. And, uh, you know, if you are the first person to visit a website, that's a very unusual pattern that we can discern as being something that's malicious highly accurately. What about protecting a user from clicking on something? Is there a way to to intercept that uh, request for a web page to, you know, to, to preload it, make sure that it's okay before you allow the user to then go visit it? Yeah, absolutely. At Area 1, part of our uh, our solution is to be comprehensive. So not only do we make sure that if the attacks are coming through uh, email, users don't get them in their inbox. So that's one way to prevent users from clicking is not even presenting them the messages that have those links or lures within them. And the second is that when users are going to those legitimate websites or when they're getting messages through alternative means, such as you got, you're protected on your corporate uh, email account, but you open up a personal Gmail tab in your browser and click our technology uh, sits in front of those web streams so that users are not resolving themselves and getting to those pages and, and going forward. Now, what about uh, the, the technology on, on, say, the consumer side? You know, if I have a Gmail account and I'm, I'm using uh, the Chrome browser to, to visit websites, um, how effective are those kinds of things that are running behind the scenes? Well, I would say that, you know, the major web companies, Microsoft and Google and Apple, are doing really amazing work on that front and they are providing a lot of capabilities but they're not perfect and uh, what we consistently see are misses around the phishing attacks that cause damage when you look at what happened at during the election uh, you see misses by google of emails going to john podesta that allowed him to reveal his username and password and allow uh, hackers to get into the election and into the campaigns and so because it only takes one click because a single miss uh, can cause so much damage. What we really focus on are plugging those gaps, and those gaps often what about end up training being people expansive, to be wary uh, of clicking of on things, or just even knowing the the things to look for uh, to know that something may not be on the up and up. Well, I think it's it's extremely important that users have an awareness and be a part of the solution, but it's a totally ineffective strategy to expect users to be perfect. And there is no example of user awareness, education, and training being effective uh, at stopping problems of uh, driving accidents, uh, the spread of infectious diseases, uh, and particularly in cybersecurity. And so while I think it's, it's really critical that companies be talking to their employees about the risks uh, in cyberspace, that it's important for uh, users to be aware, to be on the team, and to be proactive on that front. We don't stop the flu by just washing our hands. We take vaccines. Uh, and that's the role of what we do is to provide those vaccines uh, to our customers so that their users can be informed, they can be a part of the solution, but we know that they will be uh, ineffective uh, at totally stopping it because, again, it only takes one user to see something that looks extremely authentic to cause a lot of damage. What is the role that threat intelligence plays in what you do? You know, we live in a world today that's data-driven, and the ability to amass massive volumes of data and to learn from that data uh, is critical to driving actions. And so there's nothing more important than being able to uh, bring data together and then to implement that into a series of actions to change outcomes. Um, and, you know, data in its own right has no value. But when you can transform that data 
into very specific actions and you can measure what those actions are and you can measure their returns and their efficacies, then you really have something that's that's very interesting. And that's what we focus on is honing uh, data, refining it through analytics, transforming it into specific actions that stop attacks. What do you see on the horizon when it comes to fighting fishing? Do, do you ever envision a day when this sort of thing is behind us? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think it's a totally solvable problem. You know, we live in a world today where uh, mankind solves many amazing uh, feats. You know, we've sent people into outer space. My grandfather, who's 90 years old, had a heart surgery where they went through his leg. He went home the next day. Uh, we talk about reversing the effects of climate change. Uh, there is no reason that we cannot get in front of these types of cybersecurity incidents. It requires a different angle of vision new approaches. uh, But the trend is really on our side to stop these attacks, not on the attacker side. And where do you feel like we are right now? Are are we gaining on the problem or are the bad guys winning? The way I see it is is kind of two things. You know, the bad guys are certainly being very effective, right? Uh, it's, It's every day that you wake up and you learn about a company that has had an incident, the scale of those incidents uh, seem to be growing. Uh, I think often we cover the massive breaches more than the breadth of breaches that are happening to smaller businesses. Uh, The pain is really being felt and the problem is really being universally uh, subsumed uh, by everyone. That being said, attackers always get caught. And that's not a good trend for them that even with the much needed improvements and focus on the kind of core problems like phishing, uh, attackers are not walking away scot-free. Their operations are being caught, their tools are being leaked. Uh, it's being discovered that what they're doing. And so we just need to get preemptive and kind of get in front of it. And that new approach, which is based on expertise that new teams such as uh, Area One are bringing to the market, new analytic capabilities, new compute power capabilities, uh, those will really allow us to be successful uh, going forward. But it takes it takes leadership from executives at companies, and it takes action. This is a problem that needs to be acted upon today, uh, not something you want to wake up and learn you have a problem and then start responding. Our thanks to Oren Falkowitz from Area One for joining us. Don't forget to sign up for the Recorded Future Cyber Daily email, where every day you'll receive the top results for trending technical indicators that are crossing the web. Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, suspicious IP addresses, and much more. You can find that at recordedfuture.com slash intel. We hope you've enjoyed the show and that you'll subscribe and help spread the word among your colleagues and online. The Recorded Future podcast team includes coordinating producer Amanda McKeown, executive producer Greg Barrett. The show is produced by Pratt Street Media with editor John Petrick, executive producer Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner.